what people were thinking about me. But after those first six months, I was able to take strength from my wife and my son and began to take a hold of my life. And roughly one year after my crash, I contacted my old rock climbing club and told them that I wanted to come back to coach with them and that I wanted to focus on giving people a positive energy and helping them become more optimistic. There aren't many mountains in Hong Kong that are suitable for rock climbing. A lion rock is perfect. Before the accident, I was able to climb it in half an hour and when you get to the top, you can see all of Hong Kong. For those people who reached the top, they are said to have something known as lion spirit, which is persistence, resilience, and unity. I wanted to prove to myself that I still had that, and that I was still able to do everything that I had done before. It took me two years to prepare to attempt to climb. I had to learn all sorts of new rock climbing skills, as I was now only able to use my arms to climb. I also wanted to do the climb whilst still sitting in my wheelchair and for two very different reasons. Firstly, there are lots of different bits of equipment that you have to be attached to in order to be able to climb safely. This equipment can cut off the circulation to your legs. Most climbers are able to feel when this is happening and readjust. But because I would not be able to feel it, it could have been really dangerous to have the equipment attached to me. The other reason is because I had been in that chair for several years now and it had become a part of me. It had become my legs. The date I chose to go up the mountain was the fifth anniversary after my crash. It used to take me about 30 minutes to climb to the top of Lion Rock, but this time it took almost two and a half hours. When I finally reached the top, I was so happy. I actually stayed there for 30 minutes, desperately waiting for a miracle. I had hoped that I would suddenly be able to feel my legs again. Of course, that didn't happen. But I did feel that I now had new life and was able to start my next chapter. Since then, I had dedicated my life to motivating other people, especially those with disabilities. Although I'm not a religious person, I believe that this has been my destiny to be in a wheelchair and to show others that they can achieve something. So that is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. The Hong Kong-based rock climber Lai Chi Wai now witness in February 1984 a young American boy who'd lived his whole life sealed off from the outside world in a completely sterile environment died. Born with a rare genetic disorder which made him hugely susceptible to infections, he became known as the boy in the bubble. Rachel Gilman has been speaking to his mother, Carol Ann Demerit. My son David was born with a genetic defect called severe combined immunodeficiency disease. David and all children born with this particular skin have absolutely no defenses against the sea of germs that we all wander through on a daily basis. Severe combined immunodeficiency disease or SCID. No tonsils, no lymph nodes, almost a complete lack of an immune system. A year earlier, Carol Ann's first son had died of skid, and she'd been warned that any future boys would have a 50-50 chance of having the disease. When she found out she was pregnant with another son, an abortion was offered as a potential option. But the family were Roman Catholics and said no. Instead, preparations were made for a completely sterile, germ-free delivery in case the baby was indeed born with skid. The delivery room was sterilized. All unnecessary equipment was taken out of the room. The surgical team were uh, minimum. I was isolated in the hospital room uh, about 24, 48 hours before his yeah. delivery. Everybody was masked. There was no talking. It was two weeks later that it was determined that he did have skid. And, and how did you feel once you realized that your second son also had skid? I was 
heartbroken, but we knew that we would make a commitment either way to this child. So it was just forge ahead and, and what do we do next? David Better's diagnosis meant he was transported straight from delivery to a specifically designed isolator or plastic bubble, a completely germ-free, sterilised environment made from clear PVC. Two thick black gloves were attached so that his family and team of medical staff could safely hold him. As a baby, when I fed David, I would slip my hands through these huge gloves, I would pick him up and I would bring him close to my chest and I would give him a bottle. And if I held him long enough, I could feel the warmth of his body and I knew he could feel the warmth of mine. You don't always forget that you couldn't touch him because it seemed like the plastic would just go away. I, I didn't concentrate on that. I think that would have been very detrimental to my state of mind. There was no beating of the chest of why us. There was none of that. Uh, we had hope. We lived ourselves on hope. At the time, the only known cure for Skid was a bone marrow transplant. The news that David's elder sister Catherine was not an exact bone marrow match came as a big blow. To keep David free from infections, doctors designed a network of plastic bubbles for David's transportation, his supplies, his sleep bubble and a huge playroom. They were interconnected and set up in the family's living room, meaning David could visit his home for the first time at two months old. He virtually lived at home. David was happy to be at home. He learned how to say his first words at home. He took his first step at home. He knew the importance of being part of a family. I hate to think what our lives would have been like had we not been able to bring David home. As David grew, his story was reported in the press and he became known as the boy in the bubble. Carol Ann had to not only look after his physical needs, but prepare him for his extraordinary life. We wanted David to learn first that he was special because he was a son, because he was a grandson, because he was a brother, a friend, not because of his circumstances. He had chores to do, his chores were to clean his bubble at night. So it was um, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. And I said, David, it's time to go to bed. You have to clean your bubble. And he said, I don't have to clean my bubble. And I said, well, yes, you do. And he said, no, I don't have to clean my bubble. And I said, why not? And he said, because I'm a star. And I thought he meant like a star in heaven. So I said, you are a star, David. I said, you light up my life. And he looked at me and he said, not that kind of star. He said, my picture was in the paper. I am famous. I said, well, yes, you are famous. And yes, your picture was in the paper, but your picture was not in the paper today, David. So today you cleaned your bubble. <laughs> and so he did. <laughs> and through his sister, he was able to glimpse aspects of a more normal childhood. So I would take my sewing machine up, push it up against the bubble, and I would sew Catherine's costumes. Catherine was active in school, and so her little friends would come over, and they would rehearse out in the front yard, and David would look at them and, and jump up and down and cheer them on. David's celebrity was growing, and after a TV movie was screened about his life, NASA got in touch with an offer to provide a spacesuit so David could walk around outside of his bubble system for the first time. His first entry was uh, to visit various floors of the hospital. And when I think about that time, I remember how thrilled he was to go up to a laboratory and turn on a faucet himself and then turn it off and then turn it on. And he was so gleeful to be in his spacesuit. He was very happy for the ability to leave his bubble safely. But as David reached the age of 12, his parents had a decision to make. His bubbles couldn't be inflated any further. Doctors had also told the family about new research which had revealed bone marrow could be used for transplants, even if it wasn't an exact match. It seemed okay to try it. It was explained to David. He was in full support of it. All three of us were tested. Catherine was the closest match. She was designated as donor. It came time for the bone marrow transplant. In the beginning, it seemed to be working. And so David came home and uh, it was um, New Year's Eve, 1983. There was a slight elevation in his temperature. 
So the next morning I called his physician and I said, you know, his temperature is elevated one or two degrees. So immediately they called